number 10, Just Grass in the Wind, 1969. Sam keeps secrets better than mud. The sheriff parked his rig at the beginning of the fire tower lane so they wouldn't drive over any evidence of someone driving the night of the alleged murder. But as they walked along the track, looking for vehicle treads other than their own, Sam Green shifted into formless dimples with every step. Then at the mud holes and swampy areas near the tower, a profusion of detailed stories revealed themselves. A raccoon with her four young had trailed in and out of the muck, a snail had woven a lacy pattern interrupted by the arrival of a bear, and a small turtle had lain in the cool mud, its belly forming a smooth, shallow bowl. Clear as a picture, but besides our rig, not a thing man-made. I don't know, Joe said. See this straight edge? Then a little triangle? That could be a tread. No, I think that's a bit of a turkey print, where a deer stepped on top, made it look geometrical like that. After another quarter hour, the sheriff said, let's hike out to the little bay. See if somebody boated over here instead of coming by, by truck. Pushing pugnant Merle from their faces, they walked to the tiny inlet. The damp sand revealed the prints of crabs herons, and pipers, but no humans. Well, but look at this. Joe pointed to a large pattern of disturbed sand crystals that fanned into an almost perfect half circle. Could be the imprint of a round bowed boat that was pulled on shore. No, see where the wind blew this broken grass stalk back and forth through the sand, drawing this half circle. That's just grass in the wind. They stood looking around. The rest of the small half-moon beach was covered in a thick layer of broken shells. A jumble of crustacean parts and crab claws. Shells the best secret keepers of all. Number 11. Croker Sacks Full, 1956. In the winter of 1956, when Kaya was 10, Pa came hobbling to the shack less, than, less and less often. Weeks passed with no whiskey bottle on the floor, no body sprawled on the bed, no Monday money. She kept expecting to see him limping to the tree, toting his poke. One full moon, then another had passed since she'd seen him. Sycamore and hickory stretched naked limbs against the dull sky, and the relentless wind sucked any joy the winter sun might have spread across the bleakness. A useless drying wind in a sea land that couldn't dry. Sitting on the front steps, she thought about it. A poker game fight could have ended with him beat up and dumped in the swamps on a cold, rainy night. But maybe he just got fall down drunk, wandered off into the woods, and fell face first in the backwater bog. I guess he's gone for good. She bit her lips until her mouth turned white. It wasn't like the pain when Ma left. In fact, she struggled to mourn him at all. But being completely alone with a feeling so vast it echoed, and the authorities were sure to find out and take her away. She'd have to pretend, even to jumping, that Pa was still around. And there would be no Monday money. She stretched the last few dollars for weeks, surviving on grits, boiled mussels, and the occasional remnant eggs from the rainy hen. The only remaining supplies were a few matches, a nubbing of soap, and a handful of grits. A fistful of blue tips wouldn't make a winter. Without them, she couldn't boil the grits, which she fixed for herself, the gulls and the chickens. I don't know how to do life without grits. At least, she thought, wherever Pa had disappeared to this time, he had gone on foot. Kaya had the boat. Of course, she'd have to find another way to get food, but for right now, she pushed the thought to a far corner of her mind. After a supple supper of boiled mussels, which she had learned to smash into a paste and spread on soda crackers, she thumbed through Ma's beloved book, play reading the fairy tale. Even at ten, she still couldn't read. Then the kerosene light flickered, flickered, faded, and died. One minute there was a soft circle of a world. 
and then darkness. He made an O sound. Pa had always bought the kerosene and sold the lamp, so she hadn't thought much about it until it was dark. She sat for a few seconds, trying to squeeze light from the leftovers, but there was almost nothing. Then the round hump of the Frigidaire and the window frame began to take shape in the dimness, so she touched her fingers along the countertop until she found a candle stub. Lighting it would take a match, and there were only five left. The darkness was a right, was a right now thing. Swish. She struck the match, lit the candle, and the blackness retreated to the corners. But she'd seen enough of it to know she had to have light, and kerosene cost money. She opened her mouth in a shallow pant. Maybe I ought to walk to town and turn myself in to the authorities. At least they'd give me food and send me to school. But after thinking a minute, she said, No, I can't leave the gulls, the heron, the shack. The marsh is all the family I got. Sitting in the last of the candlelight, she had an idea. Earlier than usual, she got up the next morning when the tide was low, pulled on her overalls, and slipped out to the bucket, claw knife, and empty toe pad bag. Squatting in mud, she collected muscles along the sloughs like Ma had taught her, then four hours of crouching and kneeling, had two croaker sacks full. The, sl the slow sun pulled from the sea as she motored through dense fog up the jumping Gaston bait. He stood as she neared. Hello, Miss Kaya. You wanting some gas? She tucked her head. Hadn't spoken a word to anyone since her last trip to the Piggly Wiggly, and her speech was slipping some. Maybe gas, but that depends. I hear tell you. I hear tell you buy muscles, and I got some here. Can you pay me cash money and some gas throw it in? She pointed to the bags. Yes, dear. You show do. They fresh? I dug them for dawn, just now. Well then, I can give you fifty cent for one bag, a full tank for the other. Kaya smiled slightly. The real money she made herself. Thank you, was all she said. As Jumpin filled the tank, Kaya walked into his tiny store there on the wharf. She never paid it much mind because she shopped at the Piggly, but now she saw that besides bait and tobacco, she sold matches, lard, soap, sardines, Vienna sausages, squirts, soda crackers, toilet paper, and kerosene. About everything she needed in the world was right here. Lined up on the counter were five one-gallon jars filled with penny candy, red hot, jawbreakers, and sugar daddies. It seemed like more candy than would be in the world. With the muscle money, she bought matches, a candle, and grit. Kerosene and soap would have to wait for another croaker full. It took all her might not to buy a sugar daddy instead of the candle. How many bags do you buy a week? she asked. Well, now we strike it up a business deal, he asked as he laughed in his particular way, mouth closed, head thrown back. I buy, I buy about 40 pounds every two, three days. But mind, others bring them in, too. If you bring them in, and I already got some, well, you'd be out. It's first come, first serve. No other way of doing it. Okay, thank you, that'd be fine. Bye, jumping. Then she added, Oh, by the way, my pa sends his regards to you. That's so. Well, then, you do the same for me, if you please. By yourself, Miss Kaya. He smiled big as she motored away. She almost smiled herself. Buying her own gas and groceries surely made her a grown-up. Later, at the shack, when she unpacked the tiny pile of supplies, she saw a yellow and red surprise at the bottom of the bag. Not too grown-up for a sugar daddy jumping and dropped inside. She stayed ahead of the other pickers. Kaya slipped down to the marsh by candle or, or moon, her shadow wavering around on the glistening sand, and gathered mussels deep in the night. She added oysters to her catch, and sometimes slept near gullies under the stars to get the jumpings by first light. The muscle money turned out to be more reliable than the Monday money ever had, and she usually managed to beat out other pickers. She stopped going to the piggly for Mrs. Single. Singletary always asked why she wasn't in school. Sooner or later, they'd grab her, drag her in. 
She got by with her supplies from jumping and had more muscles than she could eat. They weren't that bad tossed into the grip, mashed up beyond recognition. They didn't have eyes to look at her like the fish did. Number 12, Pennies and Grit, 1956. For weeks after Pa left, Kaya would look up when ravens called. Maybe they'd seen him swing stepping through the woods. At any strange sound in the wind, she cocked her head, listening for somebody, anybody. Even a mad dash from the truant lady would be a good sport. Mostly she looked for the fishing boy. A few times over the years, she'd seen him in the distance but hadn't spoken to him since she was seven, three years ago when he showed her the way, home through the marsh. He was the only soul she knew in the world besides jumping and a few sailed ladies. Wherever she glided through the waterways, she scanned for him. One morning, as she motored into a cord grass estuary, she saw his boat tucked in, in the reeds. Kate wore a different baseball cap and was taller now, but even from more than 50 yards, she recognized the blonde curls. Kaya idled, idled, idled down, maneuvered quietly into long grass, and peered out at him. Working her lips, she thought of cruising over, maybe asking if he had caught any fish. That seemed to be what Pa and anybody else in the marsh said when they came across somebody. Anything biting? Had any nibble? But she only stared, didn't move. She felt a strong pull toward him and a strong push away, the result of being stuck firmly in this spot. Finally, she eased toward home, her heart pushing against her ribs. Every time she saw him, it was the same, watching him as she did the heron. She still collected feathers and shells, but left them, salty and sandy, strewn across the brick and board steps. She dallied some of each day while dishes piled up in the sink. And why wash overalls that got muddied up and up again? Long ago, she'd taken to wearing the old throwaway overalls from gone away siblings, her shirts, shirts full of holes. She had no more shoes at all. One evening, Kaya slipped and pink and green flowery sun slipped the pink and green flowery sundress, the one Ma had worn to church, from the wire hanger. For years now, she had fingered this beauty, the only dress Pa didn't burn had touched the little pink flowers. There was a stain across the front, a faded brown splotch under the sh shoulder strap, blood maybe. But it was faint now, scrubbed out like other bad memories. Kaya pulled the dress over her head, down her thin frame. The hem came almost to her toes, that wouldn't do. She pulled it off, hung it up to wait for another few years. It'd be a shame to cut it up, wear it to big muscles. A few days later, <coughs> a few days later, Kaya took the boat over to Point Beach, an apron of white sand several miles south of Jumpin'. Time, waves, and winds had modeled in it into an elevated tip, which collected more shells than other beaches, and she had found rare ones there. After securing her boat at the southern end, she strolled north, searching. Suddenly, distant voices, shrill and excited, drifted on the air. Instantly, she ran across the beach towards the woods, where an oak, more than 80 feet from one side to the other, stood knee-deep in the tropical ferns. Hiding behind the trees, she watched a band of kids strolling down the sand, now and then dashing around in the waves, kicking up sea spray. One boy ran ahead, another threw a football. Against the white sand, their bright, bright madras, shorts, looked like colorful, colorful birds and marked the changing season. Summer was walking toward her down the beach. As they moved closer, she flattened herself against the oak and peered around. Five girls and four boys, a bit older than she, maybe twelve. 
She recognized Chase Andrews throwing the ball to those boys. He was always wet. The girl, tall, skinny blonde, ponytail freckle face, short black hair, always wears pearls, and round chubby cheeks, hung back in a little cubby, walking slower, chattering and giggling. Their voices lifted up to Kaya like chimes. She was too young to care much about the boys, her eyes fixed on the troop of girls. Together they squatted to watch a crab skittering sideways across the sand. Laughing, they leaned against one another's shoulders until they flopped on the sand in a bundle. Kaya bit her bottom lip as she watched, wondering how it would feel to be among them. Their joy created an aura almost visible against the deepening sky. Ma had said women need one another more than they need men, but she never told her how to get inside the pod. Easily, she slipped deeper into the forest and watched from behind the giant fern until the kids wandered back down to the beach, until they were little spots on the sand the way they came. Dawn smoldered beneath gray clouds as Kaya pulled up to jump into war. He walked out of the little shop, shaking his head. I'm sorry as can be, Miss Kaya, he said, but they beat you to it. I got my week's quota of muscle. Can't buy them all. She cut the engine and the boat banged against the piling. This was the second week she'd been beat out. Her money was gone and she couldn't buy a single thing, down to pennies and grits. Miss Kaya, you gotta find some other ways to bring cash in. You can't get it all your coons up one tree. Back in her place, she sat pondering on the brick and boards and came up with another idea. She fished for eight hours straight, then soaked her catch of twenty in salt water brine through the night. At daybreak, she lined them up on the shelves of Pa's old smokehouse, the size and shape of an outhouse, built a fire in the pit, and poked green sticks into the flames that he'd done. Blue-gray smoke billowed and puffed up the chimney and through every crack in the walls, the whole shack huffing. The next day, she motored to Jumpin's and, still standing in her boat, held up her bucket. In all, it was pitiful display of small bream and carp falling apart at the seams. You buy smoked fish, jumping? I got some here. Well, I declare, your shirts, y'all sure did, Miss Kaya. Tell you what, I'll take them on consignment, like. If I sell them, you get the money. If I don't, you get them back like they, like they is. That do? Okay, thanks, jumping. <laughs> That evening, Jumpin' walked down the sandy track of Colored Town, a cluster of shacks and lean-tos, and even a few real houses squatting about on backwater bogs and mud clouds. The scattered encampment was in deep woods, back from the sea, with no breeze and more skeeters than the whole state of Georgia. Jo jo After about three miles, he could smell the smoke from cook fires drifting through the pines and hear the chatter of some of his grandchildren. There were no roads in Colored Town, just trails leading off through the woods this way and that to different family dwellings. He was a real, his was a real house, and his pa had built with pine lumber and a raw, raw wood fence around the hard pan dirt yard, which Mabel, his good-sized wife, 
swept clean as a whistle, just like a floor. No snake could slink within 30 yards of the steps without being spotted by her hoe. She came out of the house to meet him with a smile, as she often did, and he handed her the pail with Kaya's smoked fish. What's this, she asked. Looks like something even dogs wouldn't drag in. It's that girl again, Miss Kaya brought him. Sometimes she ain't the first one with mustard, so she's got the smoking fish. Wants me to sell him. Lord, we gotta do something about that child. Ain't nobody gonna buy them fish. I can't cook them up in stew. Our church can come up with some clothes, other things for her. We'll tell her there's some family that'll trade jumpers for car fees. What size is she? You asking me? Skinny. All, all I know is she's skinny as a tick on a flagpole. I expect she'll be there first thing in the morning. She's plum broke. After eating a breakfast of warm up, warmed up mussels and grits, Kaya motored over to the oven to see if any might have come in from the smoked fish. In all these years, it had just been him, there, or customers. But as she approached slowly, she saw a large black woman sweeping the wharf like it was the kitchen floor. Jumpin' was sitting in his chair, leaning back against the store wall, doing figures in his ledgers. Seeing her, he jumped up, waved. Good morning, she called quietly, drifting expertly up to the dock. Hiya, Miss Kaya. Got somebody here for you to meet. This here's my watch, Mabel. Mabel walked up and stood next to Jumpin', so that when Kaya stepped onto the wharf, they were close. Mabel reached out and took Kaya's hand, held it gently in hers, and said, It's my, it's mighty fine to meet you, Miss Kaya. Jumpin's told me what a fine girl you are. One of the best oyster pickers. In spite of holding her garden, cooking half of every day, and scrubbing and mending for wife, Mabel's hand was supple. Kaya kept her fingers in that velvet glove, but didn't know what to say, so stood quiet. Now, Miss Kaya, we got a family who will trade clothes and other stuff you need for your smoked fish. Kaya nodded, smiled at her feet, then asked, what about gas from a boat? Mabel turned to question the eyes of jumping. Well, now, he said, I'll give you some today, because I know you're short, but you keep bringing in muscles and such when you can Mabel said in her big voice, Lord, child, let's don't worry none about the details. Now let me look at you. I gotta calculate your size to tell them. She led her into the tiny shop. Let's sit right here and you tell me what clothes and what, what all else you need. After they discussed the list, Mabel traced Kaya's feet on a piece of brown paper bag, then said, well, come back tomorrow and there'll be a stack here for you. I'm much obliged, Mabel. Then her voice low said, There's something else. I found these old packages of seeds, but I don't know about gardening. Well now, Mabel leaned back and laughed deep in her generous bosom. I can sure do a garden. She went over every step in great detail, then reached into some cans on the shelf and bought out squash, tomato, and pumpkin seeds. She folded each kind into some paper and drew, and drew a picture of a vegetable on the outside. Kaya didn't know if Mabel did this because she couldn't write or because she knew Kaya couldn't read, but it worked fine for both of them. She thanked them as she stepped into her boat. I'm glad to help you, Miss Kaya. Now come back tomorrow for your things. Mabel said. That very afternoon, Kaya started hoeing the rows where Ma's garden used to be. The hoe made clucking sounds as it moved down the road, releasing earthy smells and uprooting pinkish worms. Then a different clink sounded, and Kaya bent to uncover one of Ma's old metal and plastic barrettes. She swiped it gently against her overalls until all the grit fell clear. As if reflected in the cheap artifacts, Ma's red mouth and dark eyes were clearer than they'd been in years. Kaya looked around. Surely Ma was walking up the lane even now, come to help turn this earth. Finally home. Such stillness was rare. Was rare. Even the crows were quiet, and she could hear her own breathing. Sweeping up bunches of her hair, she pinned the barrette 
over her left, above her left ear. Maybe Wa Ma was never coming home. Maybe some dreams should just fade away. She lifted the hoe and clobbered a chunk of hard clay into smithereens. When Kaya motor up to Jupin's wharf the next morning, he was alone. Perhaps the large form of his wife and her fine ideas had been an illusion. But there, sitting on the wharf, were two boxes of goods that Jopin was pointing to. A wide ground had fit. Good morning, Miss Kaya. This here's for ya. Kaya jumped into the wharf and stared at the overflowing crate. Go on then, Jumpin said. It's all it's all yourn. Gently she pulled out overalls, jeans, and real blouses, not just t shirts. A pair of navy blue lace up keds and some Buster Brown two tone saddle shoes, polished brown and white so many times they glowed. Kaya held up a white blouse with a lace collar and a blue satin bow at the neck. Her mouth opened a little bit. The other box had matches, grits, a tub of oleo, dried beans, and a whole quart of homemade lard. On top, wrapped in newspaper, were fresh turnips and greens, rutabagas, and okra. Jumping, she said softly, this is more than those fish would have cost. This could be a month's fish. Well now, what the filth's going to do with old clothes laying around the house? If they got these things extra and you need them, you got and you got fish, and they need fish, then that's the deal. You gotta take them now, cause I ain't got room for that junk around here. Kaya knew that was true. Jumpin had no extra space, so she'd be doing him a favor to take them off his wharf. I'll take them then, but you tell him thank you, will you? And I'll smoke more fish and bring it in as soon as I can. Okay then, Miss Kaya, that'll be fine. You bring in fish when you get them. Kaya chugged back into the sea. Once she rounded the peninsula, out of sight of Jopin, she idled down, dug in the box, and pulled out the blouse with the lace collar. She put it on right over her scratchy bib overalls, with patched knees, and tied the little satin ribbon into a bow at her neck. Then, one hand on the tiller, the other on lace, she glided across the ocean and estuaries toward home.
<clears throat> Number 13, Feather, 1960. Lanky yet brawny for 14, Kaya stood on an afternoon beach, stringing crumbs to gulp. Still couldn't count them, still couldn't read. No longer did she daydream of winging with eagles, perhaps when you have to paw your supper for mud. For mud, imagination flattens to that of adulthood. Ma's sundress fit snugly across her breast and fell just below her knees. She reckoned she had caught up, and then some. She walked back to the shack, got a pole in line, and went straight to fishing from a thicket on the far side of her lagoon. Just as she cast, a stick snapped behind her. She jerked her head around, searching. A football and brush. Not a bear, whose large paws squished in debris, but a solid clunk in the brambles. Then the crows caught. Crows can't keep secrets any better than mud. Once they see something curious in the forest, they have to tell everybody. Those who listen are rewarded, either warned of predators or alerted to thieves. Kaya knew something was up. She pulled in the line, wrapped it around the pole, even as she pushed silently through the brush with her shoulders. Stopped again, listen. The dark clearing, one of her favorite places, spread cabin-like under five oaks so dense only hazy streams of sunlight filtered through the canopy, striking lush patches of trillium and white violets. Her eyes scanned the clearing but saw no one. Then a shape slunk through a thicket beyond, and her eyes swung there, stopped. Her head, her heart pumped harder. She hunkered down, suit running fast and quiet into the undergrowth on the edge of the clearing. Looking back through the branches, she saw an older boy walking fast through the woods, his head moving to and fro. She stopped as she, he stopped as he saw her. Kaya dunked behind a thorn bush, then squeezed into a rabbit run that twisted through brambles thick as a fort wall. Still bent, she scrambled, scratching her arms on prickly scrub. Paused again, listening. Hid there in burning heat, her throat racking from thirst. After ten minutes, no one came. So she crept to a spring that pulled in moss and drank like a deer. She wondered who that boy was and why he come. That was the thing about going to jump him. People saw her there. Like the underbelly of a porcupine, she was exposed. Finally, between dusk and dark, that time when the shadows were unsure, she walked back toward the shack by way of the oak clearing. Because of him sneaking around, I didn't catch him of any fish to smoke. In the center of the clearing was a rotted down stump, so carpeted and moss it looked like an old man hiding under a cape. Kaya approached it, then stopped. Lodged in the stump and sticking straight up was a thin black feather about five or six inches long. To most it would have looked ordinary, maybe a crow's wing feather. But she knew it was extraordinary, for it was the eyebrow of a great blue heron, the feather that bows gracefully above the eye, extending back beyond the elegant head, beyond her elegant head. One of the most exquisite fragments of the coastal marsh, right here. She had never found one, but knew instantly what it was, having squatted eye to eye with herons all her life. A great blue heron is the color of gray mist reflecting in blue water. And like mist, she can fade into the backdrop, all of her disappearing except the concentric circles of her lock and load eyes. She is a patient, solitary hunter, standing alone as long as it takes to snatch her prey. Or, eyeing her catch, she will stride forward one slow step at a time, like a predaceous bridesmaid. And yet, on rare occasions, she hunts on the wing, darting and diving sharply, Bullet like beak in the leaves. How'd it get stuck straight up in the stump? Whispering, Kaya looked around. That boy must have pretty fierce. He could be watching me right now. She stood still, heart pounding again. Backing away, she left the feather and ran to the shack and locked the screen door, which she seldom did since it often scant protection. Yet as soon as dawn crept between the trees, she felt a strong pull toward the feather at least to look at it again. 
At sunrise, she ran to the clearing, looked around carefully, then walked to the stump and lifted the feather. It was sleek, almost velvety. Back at the shack, she found a special place for it in the center of her collection, from tiny hummingbird feathers to large eagle tails that winged across the wall. She wondered why a boy would bring her a feather. The next morning, Kaya wanted to rush to the stump to see if another one had been left, so she made herself wait. She must not run into the boy. Finally, in late morning, she walked to the clearing, approaching slowly, listening. She didn't hear or see anybody, so she stepped forward, and a rare, brief smile left her face when she saw a thin white feather stuck into the top, top of the stump. It reached from her fingertips to her elbow and curved gracefully to a slender point. She lifted it and laughed out loud. The magnificent tail feather of the tropic bird. She'd never seen these seabirds because they didn't occur in this region, but on rare occasions, they were blown over land on hurricane wing. Kaya's heart filled with wonder that someone had such a collection of rare feathers that she could spare this one. That he could spare this one. Since she couldn't read in Ma's old guidebook, since she couldn't read Ma's old guidebook, she didn't know the names for most of the birds or insects, so made up her own. And even though she couldn't write, Kaya found a way to label her specimens. Her talent had matured, and now she, she could draw, paint, and sketch anything. Using chalks or watercolors from the five and dime, she sketched the birds, insects, or shells on grocery bags and attached them to her samples. That night, she splurged and lit two candles and set them in saucers on the kitchen table so she could see all the colors of the white, so she could paint the tropic birds better. For more than a week, there was no feather on the stump. Kaya went by several times a day, cautiously peeping through the ferns, but saw nothing. She sat in the cabin in midday, something she rarely did. She had stoked beans for supper. Now it's too late. She walked through the kitchen, rummaging through the cupboards, drumming her fingers on the table. Thought of painting, but didn't. Walked against the stump. Even from some distance, she could see a long, striped tail feather of a wild turkey. It caught her up. Turkeys had been one of her favorites. She watched as many as 12 chicks stuck themselves under the mother's wings, even as the hen walked along, a few tumbling out of the back, then scrambling to catch up. But about a year ago, as Kaya strolled through a standard of pine, she'd heard a high-pitched shriek. A flock of 15 wild turkeys, mostly hens, a few toms and jakes, rushed about, pecking what looked like an oily rag crumpled in the dirt. Stuff stirred from their feet and shrouded the woods, drifting up through branches, caught there. As Kaya had crept closer, saw it was a hen turkey on the ground, and the birds of her own flock were pecking and toe-scratching her neck and head. Somehow she managed to get her wings so tangled with briars, her feathers stuck out at strange angles and she could no longer fly. Jody had said that if a bird becomes different from the others, disfigured or wounded, it is more likely to attract a predator, so the rest of the flock will kill it, which is better than drawing in an eagle, who might take one of them in the bargain. A large female clawed at the bedraggled hen with her large, horny feet, then pinned her to the ground as another female jabbed at her naked neck and head. The hen squealed, looked around with wild eyes at her own flock assaulting her. Kaya ran into the clearing, throwing her arms around. Hey, what you doing? Get out of here! Stop it! The flurry of wings kicked, kicked up more dust as the turkey scattered into brush, two of them flying heavy into an oak. But Kaya was too late. The hen, her eyes wide open, laid limp. Blood ran from the wrinkled neck, bent crooked on, on the dirt. Shoo, go on! Kaya chased the last of the large birds until they shuffled away, their business complete. She knelt next to the dead hen and covered the bird's eye with a sycamore leaf. That night, after watching the turkey, she ate a supper of leftover cornbread and beans then laid on her porch bed, watching the moon touch the lagoon. Suddenly, she heard voices in the woods coming toward the shack. They sounded nervous, squeaky, 
boys, not men. She sat straight up. There was no back door. It was get out now or still be sitting on the bed when it came. Quick as a mouse, she slipped to the door, but just then candles appeared, moving up and down, their light jiggling in halos, too late to run. The voices got louder. Here we come, Marsh girl. Hey, you in there? Miss Missin' Link? Show us your teeth. Show us your swamp grass. Peals of laughter. She ducked lower behind the half wall of the porch as the footsteps moved closer. The flames flickered, flickered madly, then went out altogether as five boys, maybe 13 or 14 years old, ran across the yard. All, talk, all talking stopped as they galloped full speed to the porch and tagged the door with their palms, making slapping sounds. Every smack of stab in the turkey, turkey hen's heart. Against the wall, Kaya wanted to whimper but held her breath. They could break through the door easy, one hard yank, and they'd be in. But they backed down the steps, ran into the trees again, hooting and hollering with relief that they had survived the marsh girl, the wolf child, the girl who couldn't spell dog. Their words and laughter carried back to her through the forest as they disappeared into the night, back to safety. She watched the relit candles bobbing through the trees, then then sat staring into the stone quiet darkness, shame. Kaya thought of that day and night whenever she saw wild turkeys, but she was thrilled to see the tail feather on the stump, just to know the game was still on. Number 14, Red Fibers, 1969. Muggy heat blurred the morning into a haze of no sea, no sky. Joe walked out of the sheriff's building and met Ed getting out of the patrol truck. Come on over here, Sheriff. Got more from the lab on the Chase Andrews case. Hot as a boar's breath inside. He led the way to a large oak, its ancient roots punching through the bare dirt-like fit. The sheriff followed, crunching acorns, and they stood in the shade, faces to the sea breeze. He read aloud, bruising on the body, interior injuries, consistent with an expensive fall. He did bang the back of his head on that beam. The blood and hair samples matched his, which caused severe bruising and damage to the posterior lobe that didn't kill him. There you have it. He died where we found him. Had not been moved. The blood and hair on the cross didn't prove it. Cause of death, sudden impact on occipital and parental lobe, parietal lobe of the posterior cerebral cortex, severed spine from falling off the tower. So somebody did destroy all the foot and fingerprints. Anything else? Listen to this. They found lots of foreign fibers on his jacket red wool fibers that didn't come from any of his clothes, sample included. The sheriff shook a small plastic bag. Both men peered at the fuzzy red thread flattened against the plastic like spider webbing. Wool, it says. Could be a sweater, scarf, hat, Joe said. Shirt, skirt, socks, cape. Hell, it could be anything. And we have to find it.
number 15, the game, 1960. The next noon, hands on her cheeks, Kaya approached the stump slowly, almost in prayer, but no feather on the stump, her lips, her lips pinched. Of, of course, I've got to leave something for her. Her pocket brought a tail feather from an immature bald eagle she found that morning. Only someone who knew birds well would know that the splotchy, tatty feather was eagle, a three-year-old, not yet crowned, not as precious as the tail feather of the tropic bird, but still a dear thing. She laid it carefully on the stump with a little rock on top, pinned from the wind. That night, arms folded under the head, she laid on her porch bed, a slight smile on her face. Her family had abandoned her to survive a swamp, but here was someone who came on his own, leaving gifts for her in the forest. Uncertainty lingered, but the more she thought about it, the less likely it seemed the boy meant her harm. It didn't fit that anyone who liked birds would be mean. The next morning, she sprang from bed and went about doing what Ma had called a deep clean. At Ma's dresser, Kaya meant only to cull the remnants of the drawers, but as she picked up her mother's brass and steel scissors, her finger holes curled and shaped with intricate patterns of lilies, she suddenly pulled back her hair, not trimmed since Ma left more than seven years ago, and cut off eight, eight inches. <clears throat> now it fell just below her shoulders. She looked at herself in the mirror, tossed her head a bit, smiled, scrubbed her fingernail, fingernails and brushed her hair till it shone. Replacing the brush and scissors, she looked down among some of Ma's old cosmetics. The liquid foundation and rouge had dried and cracked, but the shelf life of lipstick must be decades because when she opened the tube, it looked fresh. For the first time, never having played dress up as a little girl, she put some on her lips, smacked then smiled again in the mirror. So she looked a bit pretty, thought she looked a bit pretty, not like Ma, or pleasing enough. She giggled, then wiped it off. Just before closing the drawer, she saw a bottle of dried up Revlon fingernail polish, barely pink. Kaya lifted the little jar, remembering how Ma had walked back from town one day with this bottle of fingernail polish, of all things. Ma said it would look real good with their olive skin. She lined up Kaya and her two older sisters in a row on the faded sofa, told them to stick out their bare feet and painted all those toes and, and their fingernails. Then she did her own and they laughed and had a fine time flouncing around the yard, flashing their pink nails. Pa was off somewhere, but the boat was moored at the lagoon. Ma came up with the idea of all of the girls going out in the boat, something they had never done. <clears throat> they climbed into the old skiff, still cavorting like they were tipsy. It took a few pulls to get the outboard yet cranked, but finally it jumped to, and off they went. Ma steering across the lagoon and into the narrow channel that led to the marsh. <clears throat> they breezed along the waterways. But Ma didn't know all that much about it, and when they went into a shallow lagoon, they got stuck in gummy black mud, thick as tar. They pulled this way and that, but couldn't budge. There was nothing left to do but climb over the side, skirts and all, sinking in the muck up to their knees. Ma hollering, Now don't turn it over, girls, don't turn it over. They hauled on the boat until it was free, squealing at one another's muddy faces. It took some doing to get back in, flopping over the side like so many land, landed fish. And instead of sitting on the seats, the four of them squinched up at the, on the bottom of the boat, all in a line, holding their feet to the sky, wiggling their toes, their pink nails gleaming through the mud. Lying there, Ma said, You all listen now, this is a real lesson in life. Yes, we got stuck, but what we girls do? We made it fun, we laughed. That's what sisters and girlfriends are all about, sticking together even in the mud, especially in mud. Ma hadn't bought any polish remover, so when it began to peel and chip, they had faded, patchy pink nails on all their fingers and toes, reminding them of the good time they'd had, 
and that real life lesson. Looking at the old bottle, Kaya tried to see her sister's faces and said out loud, Where are you now, Ma? Why didn't you stick? As soon as she reached the oak clearing the next afternoon, Kaya saw bright, unnatural colors against the muted greens and browns of the forest. On the stump was a small red and white milk carton, and next to it, another feather. It seemed the boy had upped the ante. She walked over and picked up the feather first. Silver and soft, it was from the crest of a night heron, one of the most beautiful of the marsh. Then she looked inside the milk carton. Rolled up tight were some packages of seeds, turnips, carrots, and green beans. And at the bottom of the carton, wrapped in brown paper, a spark plug for her boat engine. She smiled again and turned a little circle. She had learned how to live without most things, but now and then she needed a spark plug. Jumpin had taught her a few minor engine repairs, but every part meant a walk to town and cash money. And yet here was an extra spark plug to be set aside until needed, a surplus. Her heart filled up, the same feeling as having a full tank of gas or seeing the sunset under a paintbrushed sky. She stood absolutely still, trying to take it in, what it meant. She had watched male birds wooing females by bringing them gifts, but she was pretty young for nesting. At the bottom of the carton was a note. She unfolded it and looked at the words, written carefully in simple script that a child could read. Kaya knew the time of the tides in her heart, could find her way home by the stars, knew every feather of an eagle, but even at 14, couldn't read these words. She had forgotten to bring anything to leave. Her pockets yielded only ordinary feathers, shells, and seed pods. So she hurried back to the shack and stood in front of her feather wall, window shopping. The most graceful were the tail feathers from a tundra swan. She took one from the wall to leave at the stump next time she passed. As evening fell, she took her blanket and slept in the marsh, close to a gully full of moon and muffled, and had two tow bags filled by dawn. Gas money. They were too heavy to tow, so she dragged the first one back toward the lagoon. Even though it wasn't the shortest route, she went by way of the oak clearing to leave the swan feather. She walked into the trees without looking, and there, leaning against the stump, was the feather boy. She recognized him as Tate, who had shown her the way home to the marsh when she was a little girl. Tate, who for years she had watched from a distance without the courage to go near. Of course, he was taller and older, probably 18. His golden hair stuck out from his cap in all manner of curls and loose bits, and his face was tanned pleasing. He was calm, smiled wide, his whole face beaming, but it was his eyes that caught her up. They were golden brown with flecks of green, and fixed on hers the way hair and eyes catch in the nose. She halted, shaken by the sudden break in the unwritten rules. That was the fun of it, a game where they didn't have to talk or even be seen. Heat rose in her face. Hey, Kaya, please don't run. It's just me, Tate, she said very quietly, slowly, like she was dumb or something. That was probably what the townspeople said of her, that she barely spoke human. Tate couldn't help staring. She must be 13 or 14, he thought. But even at that age, she had the most striking face he'd ever seen. Her large eyes nearly black, her nose slender over shapely lips, painted her in, a, in an exotic, exotic light. She was tall, thin, giving her fragile, wisdom look as though molded wild by the wind. Yet young, strapping muscles showed she was quite power. Her impulse, as always, was to run, but there was another sensation, a fullness she hadn't felt for years, as if something warm had been poured inside her heart. She thought of the feathers, the spark plug, plug the seeds. All of it might end if she ran. Without speaking, she lifted her head and held the elegant swan feather toward him. Slowly, as though she might spring like a startled fawn, she walked over and studied it in her hand. 
She watched in silence, looking only at the feather, not his face, nowhere near his eyes. Time just swan, right? Incredible, Kaya. Thank you, she said. He was much taller and bent slightly as he took it from her. Of course, this was a time for her to thank him for her, for his gift, but she stood silent, wishing he would go, wishing they could stick to their game. Trying to fill the silence, he continued, my dad's the one who taught me birds. Finally, she looked up at him and said, I can't read your note. Well, sure, since you don't go to school, I forgot. All it said was, I saw you a couple times when I was fishing, and it got me thinking that maybe you could use the seeds in the spark plug. I had extra and thought it might save you a trip to town. I figured you liked the feathers. Kaya hung her head and said, thank you for them. That was mighty fine of you. Kate noticed that while her face and body showed its early inklings and foothills of womanhood, her mannerisms and turns of phrase were somewhat childlike, in contrast to the village girls, whose mannerisms, overdoing their makeup, cussing and smoking, outranked their foothills. You're welcome. Well, I, I better be going. It's getting late. I'll drop by now and then if that's okay. Kaya didn't say a word to that. The game must be over. As soon as he realized she wasn't going to speak again, he nodded to her, touched his hat, and turned to go. But just as he ducked his head to step into the brambles, he looked back at her. You know, I could teach you to read. Number 16, reading, 1960. For days, Kate didn't return for the reading lessons. Before the feather game, loneliness had become a natural appendage to Kaya, like an arm. Now it grew loose inside her and pressed against her chest. Late one afternoon, she struck out in her boat. I can't just sit around waiting. Instead of docking and jumping, where she'd been seen, she stashed her rig in a small cove just south and carrying a croaker sack, walked down to the shaded path toward Colored Town. A soft rain had fallen most of the day, and now as the sun neared the horizon, the forest formed its own fog that drifted through speculant glades. She'd never gone to Colored Town, but knew where it was and figured she could find Jumpin' and Mabel's place once she got there. She wore je jeans and a pink blouse from Mabel. In the croaker sack were two pint jars of real runny blackberry jam she'd made herself to return Jumpin' and Mabel's kindness. A need to be with someone. A chance to ch talk with a woman friend urged her toward them. If Jumpin' wasn't home, maybe she could sit down with Mabel and visit a spell. Then, nearing a bend in the road, Kaya heard voices coming toward her. She stopped, listened carefully. Quickly, she stepped off the path into the woods and hid behind a myrtle thicket. A minute later, two white boys, dressed in rag raggedy bib overalls, came around the bend, totting, fish totting fishing tackle and a string of catfish long at their arm. She froze behind the thicket and waited. One of the boys pointed at the lens. Look ye up thar! Ain't we lucky? Here comes a nigger walking to nigger town. Kaya looked down the path, and there, walking home for the evening, was Jumpin'. Quite close, he had surely heard the boys, but he simply dropped his head, stepped into the woods to give them a berth, and moved on. What's the matter with him? Why don't he do something? Kaya raged to herself. She knew nigger was a real bad word. She knew by the way Pa had used it like a cuss word. 
Jumpin' could have knocked the boys' heads together, taught them a lesson, but he walked on fast. Just an old nig nigger walking to town. Watch out, nigger boy, don't fall down. They taunted Jumpin', who kept his eyes up on his toes. One of the boys reached down, picked up a stone, and flung it at Jumpin's back. It hit just under his shoulder blade with a thug. He lurched over a bit, kept walking. The boys laughed as he disappeared around the bend. Then they picked up more rocks and followed him. Kaya stalked through the bush until she was ahead of them, her eyes glued on their caps bobbing above the branches. She crouched at a spot where thick bushes grew next to the lane, where in seconds they would pass within a foot of her. Jumpin' was up ahead, out of sight. She twisted the cloth bag with the jam so that it was wrung tight and knotted against the jars. As the boys drew near, even with, even with the thicket, she swung the heavy bag and whacked the closest one hard across the back of his head. He pitched forward and fell on his face. Hollering and screeching, she rushed the other boy, ready to bash his head too, but he took off. She slipped about fifty yards into the trees and watched until the first boy stood holding his head and cussing. Coating the bag of jam jars, she turned back toward her boat and motored home. Thought she'd probably never go visiting again. The next day, when the sound of Tate's motor chugged through the channel, Kaya ran to the lagoon and stood in the bushes, watching him step out of his boat, holding a rucksack. Looking around, he called out to her, and she stepped slowly forward, dressed in jeans that fit a white blouse with mis mis mismatched buttons. Hey, Kaya. Sorry I couldn't get here sooner. Had to help my dad. We'll get you reading in no time. Hey, Tate. Let's sit here. He pointed at an oak tree, at an oak knee in deep shade of the lagoon. From the rucksack, he pulled out a thin, faded book of the alphabet and a lined writing pad. With a careful, slow hand, he formed the letters between the lines. A, 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 B, asking her to do the same, patient with her tongue between lips effort. As she wrote, he said the letters out loud, softly, slowly. She remembered some of the letters from Jody and Ma, but didn't know much at all about putting them into proper words. After only minutes, he said, See? You can already write a word. What do you mean? C-A-B. You can write the word cab. What's cab, she asked. He knew not to laugh. Don't worry if you don't know it. Let's keep going. Soon you'll write a word you, you know. Later, he said, you'll have to work lots more on the alphabet. It'll take a little while to get it, but you can already read a bit. I'll show you. She didn't have a grammar reader, so her first her first book was his dad's copy of Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac. He pointed to the opening sentence and asked her to read it back to him. The first word was there, and she had to go back to the alphabet and practice the sound of each letter. But he was patient, explaining the special sound of TH. And when she finally said it, she threw her arms up and laughed. Beaming, he watched her. Slowly, she unraveled each word of the sentence. There are some who can live without wild things, and some who cannot. Oh, she said. Oh, you can read, Kaya. There will never be a time again when you can't read. It ain't just that. She spoke almost in a whisper. I wasn't aware that words could hold so much. I didn't know a sentence could be so full. He smiled. That's a very good sentence. Not all words hold that much. Over the coming days, sitting on the opening in the shade or, 
for the shore and sun. Kate taught her how to read the words, which sang of the geese and cranes, real all around them. What if there be no more goose music? In between helping his dad or pitching baseball with his friends, he came to Kai's place several times a week and now, no matter what he, she was doing, weeding the garden, feeding the chickens, searching for shells, he listened to the sound of his boat coming up the channel. On the beach one day, reading about what chickadees eat for lunch, she asked him, You live with your family in Barkley Cove? I live with my dad, yes, in Barkley. Kai didn't ask if he had more family, now gone. His mom must have left him too. Part of her longed to touch his hand, a strange wanting, but her fingers wouldn't do it. Instead, she memorized the bluish veins on the inside of his wrist, as intricate as those sketched on the wings of wasps. At night, sitting at the kitchen table, she went over the lessons by kerosene lamp, its soft light seeping through the shack windows and touching the lower branches of the oak. The only light for miles and miles of blackness, except for the soft glow of fireflies. Carefully, she wrote and said each word over and over. Kate said long words were simply little ones strung together, so she wasn't afraid of them, went straight to learning quite so soon, along with that. Learning to read was the most fun she'd ever had, but she couldn't figure why Kate had offered to teach Poe white trash like her, why he'd come in the first place, bringing exquisite feathers, but she didn't ask, afraid it might get him thinking on it, send him away. Now at last, Kaya could label all her precious specimens, she took each feather, insect, shell, or flower, looked up how to spell the name in Ma's book and wrote it carefully on her brown paper bag painting. What comes after 29? She asked Kate one day. She looked at her. She knew more about tides and snow geese, eagles, and stars than most ever would, yet she couldn't count to 30. He didn't want to shame her, so it didn't show surprise. She was awfully good at reading eyes. 30, he simply said. Here, I'll show you the numbers and we'll do some basic arithmetic. It's easy. I'll bring you some books about it. She went around reading everything. The directions on the grist bag, Kate's notes, and the stories from her fairy tale books she had pretended to read for years. Then one night she made a little O sound and took the old Bible from the shelf. Sitting at the table, she turned the thin pages carefully to the one with the family name. She found her own at the very bottom. There it was, her birthday. Miss Catherine Daniel Clark, October 10th, 1945. Then, going back up the list, she read the real names of her brothers and sisters. Master Jeremy Andrew Clark, <coughs> January 2nd, 1939. Jeremy, she said out loud. Jody, I sure never thought of you as Master Jeremy. <coughs> Miss Amanda Margaret Clark, May 17, 1937. Kaya touched the name with her fingers, repeated it several times. She read on. Master Napier Murphy Clark, April 4, 1936. Kaya spoke softly. Murph, the name was Napier. At the top, the oldest, Miss Mary Helen Clark, September 19, 1934. She rubbed her fingers over the names again, which brought faces before her eyes. They blurred, but she could see them all squeezed around the table, eating stew, passing cornbread, even laughing some. She was ashamed that she had forgotten their names, but now that she found them, she would never let them go again. Above the list of children she read, Mr. Jackson Henry Clark married Miss Julian, Julianne Maria Jacquez, June 12, 1933. Not until that moment had she known her parents' proper names. She sat there for a few minutes with the Bible open on the table, her family before her. Time ensures children never know their parents young. Kaya would never see the handsome Jake 
Swagger into an Asheville soda fountain in early 1930, where he spotted Maria Jacquez, a beauty with black curls and red lips, visiting from New Orleans. Over a milkshake, he told her his family owned a plantation, and that after high school, she studied to be a lawyer and lived in a Collins mansion. But when the Depression deepened, the bank auctioned the land out from under the Clarks' feet, and his father took Jake from school. They moved down the road to a small pine cabin that once, not so long ago really, had been occupied by slaves. Jake worked the big tobacco fields, stacking leaves with black men and women, babies strapped on their backs with colorful shawls. One night, two years later, without saying goodbye, Jake left before dawn, taking with him as many fine clothes and family treasures, including his great-grandfather's gold pocket watch and his grandmother's diamond ring, as he could carry. He hitchhiked to New Orleans and found Maria living with her family in an elegant home near the waterfront. They were descendants of a French merchant, owners of a shoe factory. Jake pawned the heirlooms and entertained her in fine restaurants hung with red velvet curtains, telling her that he would buy her the column mansion. As he knelt under a magnolia tree, she agreed to marry him, and they wed in 1933 in a small church ceremony, her family standing silent. <coughs> By now, the money was gone, so he accepted a job from his father-in-law in the shoe factory. Jake assumed he would be made manager, but Mr. Jacquez, a man not easily taken in, insisted Jake learn the business from the bottom up like any other employee. So Jake labored at cutting out soles. He and Mar Maria lived in a small garage apartment furnished with a few grand pieces from her dowry, mixed with flea market tables and chairs. He enrolled in night classes to finish high school, but usually skipped out to play poker and, speaking of whiskey, came home late to his wife. After only three weeks, the teacher dropped him from the classes. Maria begged him to stop drinking, to show enthusiasm for his job so that her father would promote him. But the baby started coming and the drinking never stopped. Between 1934 and 1940, they had four children, and Jake was promoted only once. <coughs> the war with Germany was an equalizer, boiled down to the same uniform hue as everyone else who could hide his name, once again play proud. But one night, sitting in a muddy foxhole in France, someone shouted that their sergeant was shot and sprawled, bleeding 20 yards away. Mere boys, they should have been sitting in a dugout waiting for that, nervous about some fastball. Still, they jumped at once, scrambling to save the wounded man, all but one. Jake hunched in a corner, too scared to move, but a mortar exploded yellow-white just beyond the hole, shattering the bones of his left leg into fragments. When the soldiers tumbled back into the drench, dragging the sergeant, they assumed Jake had been hit while helping the others rescue their comrade. He was declared a hero. No one would ever know, except Jake. With a medal and a medical discharge, he was sent home. Determined not to work again in the shoe factory, Jake stayed only a few nights in New Orleans. With Maria standing by silently, he sold all her fine furniture and silver, then packed his family onto the train and moved them to North Carolina. He discovered from an old friend that his mother and father had died, clearing the way for his plan. He convinced Maria that living in a cabin his father had built with a fishing retreat on the coast of North Carolina would be a new start. There would be no rent, and Jake could finish high school. He bought a small fishing boat in Barkley Cove and motored through the miles of marsh waterways with his family and all their possessions piled around them, a few fine hatch boxes perched on top. When they finally broke into the lagoon, where the ratty shack with rusted out screens hunkered under the oak, Maria clutched her youngest child, Jody, fighting tears. Pa assured her, Don't you worry, none. I'll get this fixed up in no time. But Jake never improved the shack or finished high school. Soon after they arrived, 
He took up drinking and poker as a slump beginning, trying to leave that foxhole in a shot glass. After Jake never improved the shack or finished high school, Maria did what she could what she could to make a home. She bought sheets from rummage sales for the floor mattresses and a standalone tin bathtub. She washed the laundry under the yard spigot and figured out on her own how to plant a garden, how to keep chickens. Soon after they arrived, dressed in their best, she hiked the children to Barclay Go Cove to register them in school. Jake, however, scoffed at the notion of education, and more days than not, told Nurse and Jody to skip school and bring him squirrel or fish for supper. Jake took Maria for only one moon moonlit boat ride, the result of which was their last child, a daughter named Catherine Danielle, later nicknamed Kaya because when first asked, that's what she said her name was. Now and then, when sober, Jake dreamed again of completing school, making a better life for them all but the shadow of the foxhole would move across his mind. Once sure and cocky, handsome and fit, he could no longer wear the man he had become and he'd take a swig from his poke. Blending in with the fishing, with the fighting, drinking, cussing renegades of the marsh was the easiest thing Jake ever did.